Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about building public awareness and support for prevention, treatment, and recovery issues in behavioral health. Joining us in our panel today are Arthur C. Evans, Commissioner, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Fran Harding, Director, Center for Substance Abuse Prevention, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. John Schinholzer, President, McShin Foundation, Richmond, Virginia. Pat Taylor, Executive Director, Faces and Voices of Recovery, Washington, D.C. Fran, why is there a need to increase public awareness and support related to mental and substance use disorders? It's a good question uh, because many people are thinking that they've seen way too much information on this. And in fact, what we have learned is that we have to get the message out so people understand the facts. They understand that substance abuse and mental health disorders are, is just another chronic illness or problem uh, in the public health realm. And we want, as we move closer to health reform, we want the American public to understand that where we fit into overall health and general medicine. So we're, we need to get the message not only to parents, not only to young people, but to schools, to faith-based organizations, to communities, to businesses. Every piece of America needs to understand how substance abuse and mental health fits in overall health. And Arthur, there are indeed um, many aspects of that message, aren't there? I mean, there, you know, Fran mentioned some of the audiences, but, but what other types of messages? Are there issues related to discrimination and, and, and public attitudes about our field? Yes, I think there are, and I think Fran's comments are right on point because the, the reality is that substance use disorders, mental health uh, conditions, are conditions that are very prevalent um, and that they are very treatable. So I, I think that the, the two messages are, one, that, that uh, people who have these conditions are not um, abnormal uh, in, the sense that, in, in that sense, uh, but more importantly, that, that there are treatments that work and that are very effective. One of the challenges we have in the field is that um, most of the people who have, for example, addictions don't go into treatment. So less than 10% of the people who have an addiction uh, that could be treated will actually access treatment. Um, so that means 90% of the people who are addicted in this country could benefit from treatment, don't come to treatment, and most of those people don't recognize that they have a problem that they could seek help and get help. So I think we have a long ways to go, one, to, to raise awareness about the prevalence, but more importantly, that there's help out there that can work for people. And Pat, they really do uh, uh, fail to go into treatment because they feel that it's, it's their own moral failing and that they don't view it as a illness. I think that's part of the situation we face today, but another part of it is that uh, we have treated addiction as a criminal justice issue rather than a health issue. And what's really exciting about health reform is it changes the conversation and it changes the message about the fact if you have a problem with alcohol and drugs or if you have a mental health condition, that there's a place that you can get help not in the criminal justice system. So that re-messaging changes how people think about themselves, but also how society thinks about people with addiction and with mental health conditions. So it's an exciting opportunity to help people change how they think about themselves, but also the, the systems of care and support that are out there to readjust how they're thinking about it as well so that more people can get the help that they need to recover. John, that's easier said than done, isn't it? Well, you know, I was sitting there thinking, you know, there's so many people out here that would like help that are trying to get help and they can't even get it. It's nice to think of trying to get the message to the ones who need it that don't think they need it, but we're not even dealing with the ones that need help. So I, th I think our priorities need to be realigned. We need to actually serve the ones that are asking for it, give them appropriate help as they ask for it when they need it, and we'll get a much better outcome for the other ones. Who would you see as the primary audience that we have to reach with that kind of message? Well, we, we already know that, as Pat mentioned, the criminal justice system 
full of addicts and alcoholics, substance use disorders, co-occurring disorders, they cried for help. And then you have what I like to call the, I don't know, the, the uh, social media age, you know. It, it's obliterated, you know, just so much information is out there on making drug use and alcohol use look so good and glamorous. Well, that's a bad message in there. We, we need to send the truth to these people as well. So, like I said earlier, if we help the ones that need it, that right there, there'll be a backdraft to help the other ones. And then you'll get greater awareness. And, and, you know, you deal with one problem, open the door to dealing with the next one. There's a baton order for this, I think. And, Fran, we're really talking about, uh, as we look at what John mentioned in terms of social marketing in the context of new media, Twitter, Facebook, on and on and on, YouTube, are we going to reach for prevention, for example? Are we going to reach, um, you know, the families, the youth, but who else beyond them do we have to reach? We look at it in the field of prevention because you need both prevention, treatment, and recovery services to be able to bring all of this information and change. If you're going to, if we're going to uh, succeed in changing the country's messaging and behaviors around substance abuse and mental health disorders, then we have to approach everyone. So we're, we're looking at um, not only families and kids, especially when you're talking about prevention, they think those are the only. You have to, anyone that touches a child is the easiest way to think about it when in the prevention field. Anyone that touches a family member of someone who is in recovery is another way to look at it. And, and then of course, anyone that touches someone who is in current treatment. Um, so we need to get to families and communities and people that are in all the communities that support like teachers and faith-based organization leaders and, and the media. The media sometimes can be our friend uh, when they send out messages for us. For instance, SAMHSA just sponsored, just finished sponsoring nine months worth of a parent, parental message around underage drinking in Times Square. Nine full months. We had millions of, of hits on that because every 15 seconds, was a message. That was shocking for some to, to look up in Times Square and see a message on underage drinking. Though every little piece has its part, and that's why we do multiple messaging. We're using multiple people with multiple targets. And Arthur, uh, the, the messaging, we, we were all talking about we need to message, message, message. What is it that we need to say? Because there, there are various tiers. For example, there's a, you're in a state, you have to work with your legislature or else if you don't get resources, you're not going to get it. You, you're in a state where you need to talk to other policy people because you're trying to sustain a recovery-oriented system of care for both mental and substance use disorders that needs to get people coordinated. And what is, what is the primary <laughs> message? Well, I think that there are multiple audiences and that there are multiple messages. So, and, and I think one of the things that I've learned uh, being an administrator in, in the field is that you really have to tailor those messages. For, so for example, when you're talking to the criminal justice system, uh, the messages are about how do you reduce recidivism? How do you reduce costs in that system? If you're talking to educators, one of the things we know is that one of the best predictors at, uh, of whether or not a child is going to be successful in school is whether they have a social and emotional problem. So you have to frame the issue that way. When you're talking to businesses... And you have to talk to them about assessing the students. You have to talk to them about providing continuity of support or... Yeah, but I think you first have to get their attention on the okay. issue, and I think people don't necessarily connect the dots that when you have untreated addiction, mental health problems, that that lead to problems in their systems or into their, their realm. When you're talking to the business community, you've got to talk about cent dollars and cents, that um, we know that there's a huge cost to businesses in terms of absenteeism and presenteeism, where people show up and they're just not productive. So I think we have to frame the messages based on the audience. and. Unfortunately, because of the prevalence of, of behavioral health conditions, uh, these conditions impact every aspect of society. There's uh, no part of society, there's no tier of society or no uh, part of society that's not affected. I think we have to just make sure that people see the, the connection and understand how treatment, prevention help uh, folks in some of these other areas. 
And another audience is policymakers. Part of our job and part of our messaging has to be to policymakers that it's a good investment, that people can and do get well, and that there's a reason uh, for them to make it possible and support the prevention, treatment, and recovery support services that people need. And unless we can deliver that message to policymakers, uh, we, we really have our, we have a big job ahead of us in terms of letting them know uh, about the reality of recovery, that it's a good investment, uh, and, and that the discriminatory laws that they have passed that are barriers to people staying in recovery need to be repealed because uh, with the advent of health reform, we're going to be investing in millions and millions of more people getting help and getting well. If those people can't keep their lives together, can't get jobs, can't get housing, then we've only done half the job. So policymakers need to understand the implications of their policies in terms of community health, in terms of parents, in terms of kids, and what that all means. John, I do want to come back to you because I know that you've talked to those policymakers, and I want to get your, your oh, absolute input. Oh, we'll be right input. back. This year, as the Affordable Care Act rolls out and as increased coverage rolls out, we know that people with mental health and substance abuse issues have a harder time sometimes getting enrolled in insurance and in other um, uh, opportunities they have for getting coverage. So we are trying to do special efforts to help people understand how they might do that to work with providers who work with people with uh, mental health and substance abuse issues to know how to get people enrolled. The enrollment process is going to be a simplified enrollment process for everyone, um, and we're uh, it's, so it's going to be a change, and yet it's going to be easier. So the trick is getting people information about that, and also, frankly, getting people information about why it's important to have that coverage. The overall purpose of increasing community support and public awareness about uh, prevention, treatment, recovery is to assist uh, those who are in need of uh, treatment services to enhance the ability of those in the community to promote prevention activities and awareness about the various issues associated with mental illness or substance use disorders. Uh, and also to mobilize the resources in the community to help facilitate uh, early intervention and uh, to promote recovery. Every day, I seek a positive direction for my life. Through my accomplishments. And now, with help. And support from my family and others I own. I own. I own my recovery from addiction and depression. Join, Join the Voices, Voices for, for recovery. recovery. It's worth it. For information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Well, I think the we have to overcome that negative stigma out there. We have still got to sell ourselves to the to the community as necessary. We have got to let everybody know that a, a recovery is abundant, it's available, it's not that expensive, and you know where to go get it. We have to let people know where we're at. Like our recovery center, you know, we have over two thousand meetings a year open to the public, and we constantly let our neighborhood know we're there. So you have got to. Keep reinventing your message. You know, you don't have to reinvent the message. You just got to keep re-delivering it. You know, you got to constantly be out there like a daily newspaper. So, John, let's continue. I know that you uh, are always, you're in Richmond. You talk to people. What is your message? Well, I did want to follow up on that little prevention dialogue we had. What I wanted to point out was that out of the, there must be 25 million Americans in recovery today. And, and I'm in long-term recovery myself. And the recovery community, we always marvel on how we probably one of the best prevention mechanisms out there because when we're recovering, our families are recovering. The people who lie, we come in touch with are in recovery. So I just wanted to touch on that. When we do move forward with prevention ideas, evidence-based practices, I think the recovery community, I know the recovery community has got to be one of the, the biggest 
un underutilized prevention mechanisms out there. And, and to put some attention in that direction, I think, would benefit us greatly. So, And how do you use them in, in, in your work in Richmond? Well, if you're in recovery in our circles and you have families, you will talk about your recovery process. How did you recover? What did you do that worked? You know, you hear a lot about evidence-based practice, but rarely do they really get down to the nuts and bolts. Okay, this is what we do. You know, we show up. We, we get part of the recovery herd. We become part of. So. And is that effective with the legislative sector? Or I don't the state? think anything's more effective when you take actual recovering people down to the General Assembly bill. When you when you got 100 people running around those floors giving out recovery information, this is what we're doing. We're not only talking about stories, we actually, we bring the burning bush to the legislators. This is the situation, this is what works, this is what needs to be done. Very, very effective, and after a while, these legislators start calling us up when they need help. Hey, my nephew's got a problem, could you, you know, can I send them over to you? Mm -hmm. So, we build a not only information network, but actual service network. These, these politicians are coming to the recovering people for services as equal as they would any other provider out there. So I think that speaks volumes right there. Well, and also recovery community centers and other services and places in communities that recovery community organizations have developed are places where the whole community can come and do activities that don't in involve alcohol and other drugs. So the prevention message, the prevention lifestyle is the recovery lifestyle in so many ways. And as uh, like there are 25 recovery community centers in New England alone that are open seven days a week where people know they can come if they need help, family members can come for support. So it's de developing a culture of recovery in our communities is also um, developing a culture that supports people not using alcohol and other drugs. So that's a really important contribution in terms of changing public attitudes because mm -hmm. someone knows that on Main Street there's a place people can go if they need help and if you're in long-term recovery you're there also. So it's changing the culture. Fran, part of the messaging to the various audiences that we talked about is the cost of addiction and mental illness to society. Yeah, it's one of, it's one of the um, most difficult conversations to have with people. And the, re the reason why is because we haven't been able to get the messaging out there that we are talking about uh, people with an illness or people with a disease or a condition. Um, it, it is a uh, biological, psychological, uh, physiological issue that is all combined. So when we try to show them that if we could prevent and when we get the ear of policymakers, state legislators, or um, Congress, or even uh, county or community leaders, that they can see if we can prevent people from even entering in to, to the danger zones of addiction, if they could understand that there's a predisposition. So they need to look at their life a little differently. Just like a, a family that's raising um, a child with diabetes. Well, when they have another child, there's a good chance, because the parents have the diabetes to begin with, that that child uh, is predisposed to have it. Doesn't mean they'll have it. Same thing with addiction we're finding out. If your parents have addiction, then there's a, there you are predisposed of having a greater risk. All of that information and facts are just part of so many issues that we want to get across to the American public. And part of that, especially now with the economy and health reform, is showing them all the cost savings and the expense of treating someone with an addiction, the expense and the pain in a family of treating someone with a mental illness. It's very difficult, very expensive, and preventable, and we can. And if we can't prevent certain things, we can intervene and make it easier for them in the future. So, Arthur, I go to someone. I say, two hundred forty-seven billion dollar uh, expenditures for people with alcohol or drug problems. Over two hundred billion for people who smoke, et cetera, et cetera. Those that have an untreated mental illness or a mental disorder. And, and people say what to you? Uh, first of all, if you say that, their eyes are gonna glaze over because yeah. they're, not gonna, they're not gonna be able to <laughs> comprehend the number. You know, I, I really think we have to, to make things relevant to people's lives and to what they do. And, and, and so that's why I think that you have to break those numbers down and, and put them in terms that people understand. So teachers understand when 
children don't graduate from school or children can't pay attention uh, in a classroom. And business people understand when their bottom lines are effective. So I think we have to break those numbers down uh, and, make, and make the connection uh, for people. But then more importantly is to talk about when you do make treatment accessible to people, uh, we have a tremendous return on our investment. So for example, in, in medicine, one of the highest drivers, of, uh, one of the biggest drivers of costs in medicine today is untreated mental illness and, and addiction. Uh, and studies after studies show that if you treat addiction, you save a lot of money on the physical health side. And so we're going into uh, healthcare reform. I think we have an opportunity, uh, because of how healthcare is gonna be refinanced, to make that argument and to build in mechanisms for um, treatment of addiction, behavioral health conditions to be uh, a part of it. If the incentives on the physical health side are uh, such that uh, you don't get paid as a provider unless you meet certain kinds of outcomes, it's a tremendous opportunity for the field to say, you can't make those outcomes unless you treat these conditions. And I think the, the smart providers understand that, and so you see now uh, with uh, accountable care organizations and those kinds of things, people on the physical health side saying, we need you. And if we don't have you, we can't meet the outcomes. If we don't get the outcomes, we don't get the payments. And so I think the, the, the health care reform really gives us an opportunity to really change the, dy 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 the dynamic uh, from one where we're trying to convince people to one where people are going to be coming to the field to say, we need your help in order to, to be successful. Excellent point. I also want to uh, touch on the fact that because of this transition with the uh, Affordable Care Act, there will be talking about messaging. We will need to message to the people that are gonna get those services. And how, how does one go about in formulating the message uh, to those people? Well, I think that there are some public policy issues that we, we really have to deal with. And I think one of them is right now we have a healthcare system that is based on illness. Uh, some people have referred to it as a sick care system instead of a health care system. Uh, I have a billion dollar budget in Philadelphia, uh, over a billion dollars. Less than 3% of that budget is spent on anything other than treatment. That means that most of the resources in health care today are spent after the fact, after people are sick, after people need treatment. If we spent even a, a, a small pr proportion, a third of my budget, on things like early intervention, on prevention, we have much more efficient healthcare system. And, and I think that the, the messaging has to be, how do we get further upstream? How do we um, build into our healthcare system the mechanisms to do early intervention? And th 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 some of these technologies exist. There's a, a technology called uh, screening and brief intervention. But in most systems, it's not a reimbursable service. That's a service that can be built into healthcare, private, primary care settings, uh, that is very effective at both identifying people who have addictions, but intervening in a very low cost way that has been demonstrated to have pretty significant uh, outcomes and, and impacts on, in terms of both cost and, and, and health outcomes. So the message has to go to CMS? I think putting the, um, together. CMS, I think certainly CMS, I think, you know, I'm a policymaker, but you know, I'm, I'm at, uh, at a, at a um, uh, at a local level, uh, the policy changes have to happen throughout our, our healthcare system. They have to happen at the local level, at the state level, and especially at the federal level. I think CMS can do a lot to uh, make the reimbursement of services much more flexible, give the people who are running uh, systems around the country uh, the flexibility to do more of the upstream kinds of strategies, uh, and I think we get a much greater return on our healthcare dollar. Very good. And when we come back, we're going to be continue this conversation, get into what people in recovery can do to get better access to information and what the government, states, everyone needs to do to really move and improve upon our system of care. We'll be right back. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved, or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. I felt broken. I needed help for my addiction and depression. And with the help of my family and recovery support community, I am whole again. 
Join the Voices for Recovery. It's worth it. For information on prevention and treatment referral, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The organization that I um, represent and am a part of is Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America. The work that we do, it is changing communities from the inside out so that they are better prepared to address the issue of substance abuse. And it requires everybody working together, whether it be law enforcement, be health providers, the education community, the faith community, parents, everyone coming together around this coalition in order to solve the problems. CADCA has been amazingly uh, successful in teaching us the importance of communicating those messages, best practice, how to do that through strategizers and um, our trainings where we are educating actually on the grassroots level. On an annual basis, CADCA trains more than 12,000 adult coalition leaders throughout the nation. We have our national leadership forum. The best thing about CADCA's leadership forum is the fact that we really get a chance to hear about the latest and greatest about how to combat the issues. It's an opportunity for everyone that's part of the coalition movement to come together at one point during the year, uh, receive great training, hear from national experts, um, actually get to ask questions with uh, you know, major government officials that you think you'd never be able to connect with. Um, but for the coalitions, it's really an opportunity to look around and go, hey, you know, I'm not in this alone. Um, I'm part of a national movement, and there's people out there that I can network with and learn from. Public awareness creates change, and without the awareness of the public, then we're dead in the water. We're not able to move our issues forward. We're not able to create healthier and safer communities. So we employ a multitude of strategies to make this happen. Um, they, have, they have dragged me into the social media age. We have a website. We hold press conferences. We blog. We tweet. We post on Facebook. Uh, we podcast. We um, release uh, press releases. We tie those um, to major uh, news events. <laughs> And then there's CADCA TV, which not only targets a coalition audience, but um, it reaches an average of 7 million households. So we have an opportunity to talk to uh, the general public about these important issues. One of the major things that CADCA has done for us is in terms of advocacy. You're going to go to Capitol Hill to meet with my colleagues. About establishing those relationships, why they're important, and how to really make those not only just about the conversations, but truly making friendships. And to where when the issues are so important to us, that they automatically become important to somebody who has the power to make a difference. The partnership that we have with CADCA and SAMHSA um, and our project officers has enabled us to be successful in ways that I never knew we could be. We would not be successful with our coalitions. They are critical to our success. They bring to Washington the voice of local members so the members of Congress will then understand and appreciate and react to their voice. Our coalitions are working on one of the most important public health issues of our time. And the great thing to note is that prevention works. Prevention saves lives and it saves money. I come to work every day excited about having the privilege to reach out to communities and to help them uh, address this very critical public health issue. Let me go to Pat and, and, and note um, that I know that Faces and Voices has a particular interest in bringing the message of the changes that ACA will bring. And, and what is that message, Pat? That addiction recovery is a health care issue. We have a briefing, on, briefing document on our website that explains why. And one of the important uh, issues that we cover in that is the opportunity for so many people 
who haven't been covered in the past to be covered. And we've learned from the state of Massachusetts, which implemented health reform a few years ago, that people with addiction and people with mental illness have not been able to take advantage of this opportunity for health care coverage. And so one of the great challenges that we have as a community is how to message to people about the opportunity to enroll on October 1st of 2013. And John and many recovery community organizations around the country hold something called Rally for Recovery each year. And there were 18,000 people in Philadelphia, over 100,000 people all over the country. So this year for Recovery Month, we want to let people know that with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, it's time to enroll and to educate families and others about these new rights and benefits that come to them under the law. So with 20 million Americans in long-term recovery, we know that recovery works. The question is, how can we get help to those who still don't have it? And that's a responsibility that we have. John. Well, you know, I was sitting there and chomping a bit, listening to Arthur and Fran speak earlier. Recovery, you, you, you would think you got 25 million people in recovery out there you would lean on those people's experiences. Okay, what work? Let's implement that. Let's add value to what you people are doing. Affordable Care Act, Medicaid expansion, that's going to be a solution for a lot of our problems if these states would buy into it. But you drop back on Virginia, for example. They spend five, six, seven billion dollars a year on the consequences of addiction. This past July, the governor signed several bills. One was to recognize recovery support services and, and reimburse but they stripped the funding out of it. Yet he signed a bill that probably added $100 million to the Department of Corrections budget to you know, further sentencing on you know, pot dealers and whatnot. Now, I'm not saying public safety, you know, that's very important. I get that part. But we need to shift that conversation. Exactly. But the recovery community, I mean, I think that is going to be a major solution, that, that we need to invest more time, energy, money, and, and furthermore, we need to respect and value those people. And Face and Voice of Recovery has done an excellent job elevating the value of the recovery community nationwide, trying to get these policy makers together, these politicians together. Look, let's, let's listen to these folks. You know, they got, they got game. We want that game. So obviously national organizations such as Faces and Voices of Recovery. And, and, and what other organizations? You know, I know that for the mental health community, there's NAMI, there's CADCA. Well, there's the Coalition for Whole Health, which is a really exciting national organization where people with mental illness and others are coming together to advocate jointly. So it's NAMI, Mental Health America, Faces and Voices of Recovery, the Legal Action Center, working with advocates as part of a coalition nationally and then working in states because we need to advocate at the state level to make sure that the recovery supports and other activities that we know need to be part of health reform are implemented at the state level. So advocating on the essential health benefit, for example, to make sure that the full continuum of care that people need to recover both from addiction and mental illness are available. And Fran, these organizations, are they, um, how likely are they to really pick up the mantle, as Pat was noting, that they have to pick up. Is there a federal role, state role in this process, and if so, what is it? I think there's both, and I'll let Arthur speak for himself, but the in the federal role, what we're doing, and we're doing very well, by the way, uh, the we are bringing um, these federal, these um, national organizations together, and then we're asking in a local level, in a state and local level, to do the same thing. So we're, and we're bringing what we call um, not traditional partners. So the mental health um, organizations are meeting with the substance abuse organizations. The mental health and the substance abuse organizations are coming together and meeting with insurance companies. They're meeting with business companies. Um, they're meeting and with And why families. is it important for them to meet with the insurance because of, sector? Because if we're going to go together hand in hand into health reform and we want to change the message and we want to be able to have America be able to take those brand new cards for insurance and be able to bring them to get services so there is more accessible, affordable treatment for addictions. There, there are more prevention programs for people, especially around in schools and, and in communities for kids that are being bullied and, and um, the LGBTQ communities and, and all these areas that we've kind of left alone for a while. We're all working together and that's the key. 
that prevention, treatment, and recovery services with the national and local organizations coming together will march, so to speak, on uh, to be able to send the same message. It's all about messaging, and it's all about supporting each other. Arthur. Well, uh, what I would say is that um, I think government plays a, a large role in supporting these organizations, and it's really critical. So Pat mentioned that in Philadelphia we had 18,000 people at our recovery walk uh, last uh, this uh, uh, past fall. That is significant. The first recovery walk in Philadelphia, which is done by a, an organization called PROACT, a, a, a community of recovery, I had maybe 150 people. Uh, but because of our partnership with them, bringing our providers to the table, uh, and the emphasis that we've had in Philadelphia on the fact that recovery is possible, we. We in our department uh, do a variety of things from during recovery to, month. During, well, throughout the year, for example, uh, you know, one of the things that we think is really important, and Pat's organization has been uh, le the leader in the country around this, is putting a face on recovery. Mm -hmm. We think that's really, really important. Most people work next to, they worship next to people in recovery. Most of the time, they don't know it, and so people in recovery seem like the other. Uh, and so the idea of putting a face on recovery is something that we've really adopted in our, in our service system, uh, and we've done a lot of things to support that, in addition to a, a number of other things that we've done. But that partnership has led to uh, now a recovery walk, which I think is the largest in the country. It's uh, 18,000 people. Think of this, 18,000 people walking in the streets of Philadelphia saying uh, recovery is possible. I mean, that was unimaginable even to us in the city mm -hmm even five or six years ago. Uh, so it really talks, it speaks to the power of the partnership and what can happen. And we fully expect that next year we're gonna top 20,000 people or hopefully uh, larger. Uh, and every time we um, do that, it sends a very strong message to the community that recovery is possible, that people in recovery are your neighbors. Um, and that we ought to work together to, to achieve this. And there are a lot of opportunity to um, garner that support and that strength in, in issues that are, other issues that are gonna be coming up on, on with S ACA, mm -hmm. such as electronic health records, for example, which is a whole new way of really communicating health information to the patients and between and among doctors. Uh, so is, is that an area that we can also look at the, where this particular um, force, you know, within, within the state and within the local community can, can also help? Sure, I think that the issue of electronic health records is really important. If we're gonna have an integrated healthcare system, we have to have an integrated uh, medical record system. And, and right now, as you, as you may know, that in the ACA uh, legislation, behavioral health care was left out. I think that was a huge mistake, um, mainly because of some of the, the, the issues we've talked about before, which, it, which is you really can't treat uh, even uh, most chronic health conditions without having a strategy around uh, treating behavioral health conditions because it's so interrelated. And if you don't have an integrated record that uh, includes the behavioral health conditions along with the physical health conditions, um, you're just not gonna be ef effective. So I think you're absolutely right. We have to think about, and you know, there are people in Congress that are trying to, to change that. Yeah. And when we come back, I wanna go back to, because SAMHSA is really in the forefront of working towards really getting behavioral health integrated into SEA, so I wanna come back to that. We'll be right back. Before, addiction and depression kept me from living my life. And now, every step I take in recovery benefits everyone. There are many options that make the road to recovery more accessible. It begins with the first step. Join the Voices for Recovery. For information and treatment referral for you or someone you love, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.
The National Alliance on Mental Illness, also known as NAMI, has a mission to help improve the lives of people affected by mental illness. The bottom line is to save lives and to support recovery. Our approach in support groups and education groups and what we do on the information helpline really has to do with recovery and the ability of each person to live in the community as much as possible to engage and to give people the idea that recovery is a possibility, that people with these illnesses from depression to schizophrenia live in the community and have lives and work and none of this means that your life is going to come to an end. In my lifetime people used to whisper about cancer. They wouldn't talk about it. It was not talked about. And it's the same with mental illness, that people don't want to talk about it because it can be debilitating. It's critical that we really do have a national dialogue on it um, and that the national dialogue frankly not focus on worst case scenario, but really focus on recovery. Reaching out, speaking out, and changing attitudes usually involves personal contact. You have to meet people in the public sector where they are, because if you don't, you won't reach them. You won't get to them, and you can do that through flyers, through newsletters, all the websites, teleconferences, webinars, all these activities promote community awareness. That's where we depend very much on the In Our Own Voice program. It's part of that broader person-to-person -person strategy. The In Our Own Voice program has two people living with a mental illness that kind of walk through from their dark days, understanding their diagnosis, how they got help, what living in recovery looks like for them. And then we give the audience a chance to ask questions. And in many ways, that's the most powerful part of it because we say, is there something you wanted to know but were afraid to ask? Ask us. We've lived this um, and we can guarantee you that nothing you're going to ask us isn't things that we haven't heard before um, and we know you wonder. NAMI Helpline, this is Anne. May I help you? At the helpline where I work, we seek to get the word out about NAMI's community presence. On the helpline we speak to really the full gamut of people who have some connection to mental illness. We talk to people with mental illnesses. We talk to family members a lot. Um, and we talk to professionals. And then everybody is some conglomeration of that, even our staff. Um, so if we can get the word out to people that there's hope to say, no, there are other people in your town who have the same problem and they thought they were the only ones, um, I think that's very powerful. NAMI walks and NAMI bikes bring people together because they reach out to and draw in uh, people who are not necessarily part of the mental health community. They are uh, upbeat, creative celebration events that draws people and helps get them involved in, in, in thinking about mental illness. You have to go on a walk in order to get the full feeling of a walk. It is the most camaraderie. I have been on almost every NAMI walk since the inception. We are here to reduce stigma. That's the biggest thing for the walks and the bikes, to reduce the stigma surrounding uh, mental wellness. The other impact is that people in the community see the broad community see who the people are in the mental health community. They realize that it's their neighbors and friends that makes a difference. That's part, that's part of education. And friend, let's go back to what Arthur was saying about what the ACA uh, uh, is doing in terms of behavioral health. I know Pam has been extremely active mm -hmm. through CMS, through other federal agencies to attempt to position the issue of behavioral health. What does that entail? Well, it entails a, a, a few things in all of the different uh, levels of um, services that SAMHSA offers uh, under behavioral health. Uh, in the prevention area, 
uh, we're looking at what services are we going to fund? What, what is fundable? Now, we're, we're, what we're looking, what, what is going to be funded are the interventions. And that's not going to cover all of prevention services. So this uh, screening and brief intervention that was discussed earlier, that is, is an opportunity for us to get coverage across the country. Prevention services at the community level, which we can talk about later, um, doesn't need to be covered. So we're, we're gonna, we can talk about how they relate. Um, the electronic health records. Electronic health records uh, across the country is, uh, will help us out enormously. And we're spending a lot of time working with CMS and working with insurance companies and helping them understand um, how being connected will help stopping um, uh, people from going to different doctors across state lines uh, and such like that. We're also looking at helping um, to bring the community together and getting them engaged so that they know that they can go and ask for services for substance abuse and mental health um, to be able to be covered under their, health, their insurance companies from a state level. Because although the federal government can fight and work for getting many of our services recognized at, at the level of federal government with, um, with insurance under ACA, it's the real work is happening at the state in the communities. Arthur, you were talking about some community uh, efforts that need to take place. You want to expand on that? Well, I think we've had uh, what I call a black box approach to treatment and the issue of behavioral health conditions, which basically means we build a treatment black box in the community. We wait for people to uh, recognize that they need help and then passively, hopefully, people will come to treatment. That approach really doesn't work. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it doesn't work. It doesn't work as effectively as if we had a different paradigm, a paradigm that understood that um, what we have to do is to engage com communities. We have to get out of sort of the treatment black box uh, and look at how do we take a public health approach to this issue in the same way that we have with, um, with physical health conditions. Most people know that if you wash your hands, you can save a lot of money just on the healthcare costs because people don't get sick. Uh, well, there are things that we know from a behavioral health standpoint that if we do those things, people won't develop addictions or they won't develop uh, mental health problems. Uh, and so we have to put more emphasis on those kinds of things and those things require us to have a different kind of relationship with the community. Uh, we need to be talking about the importance of addressing early childhood uh, experiences in terms of trauma, for example. Um, uh, studies show that people who experience a, a lot of adverse childhood um, uh, events are more likely to have a whole host of issues, including behavioral health conditions. And so if we can intervene early um, in those kinds of, in, in people's lives, uh, it prevents people from developing problems later on. Okay. And John, you wanted to add some well, points related I was, to- I was just thinking, you know, Face and Voices of Recovery done a great job mobilizing the recovering community across the country. And what we've discovered that things aren't equal across the country. Granted, there's, there's pockets of funding out there that for treatment and nobody gets enough funding, but the recovering support services, peer-delivered recovery support services, they they get hardly anything. And just if you could throw a little bit of funds on those alone, remember you got 25 million Americans in recovery. They're itching to get into the game. Every, the 25 million Americans that need recovery, it's almost as if there's an invisible barrier there to access these dollars to deliver these services to get this great outcome. So the recovery community has got to do a better job articulating their needs and how we're going to get there without offending everybody. And that's a delicate balance in that. It, it is a delicate balance. And that, that, that sort of public education, Pat, I know you have some... Uh, programs that promote, as John was saying, this this particular perspective. Right, all across the country, people in recovery are engaged now as service providers providing peer recovery support services. And one of the exciting uh, opportunities with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act is new roles in our health system for people in recovery. So, for example, if we want to encourage people to enroll in health reform to help people navigate this new system, there may be new, I think there will be new opportunities for people uh, to be trained in these new roles, but also that there's this growing network of uh, innovative services that are helping people initiate their recovery, help people while they are receiving treatment to support their recovery, and then once they're back in the community to connect with the other uh, supports and resources that people need. Because 
because uh, for recovery to happen in communities where it does happen, uh, people also need access to housing, access to employment, access to other kinds of supports to help them sustain uh, the recovery for the long haul. So our, our opportunity really as an organized recovery community is to advocate on behalf of an essential health benefit in the state of Virginia that will reimburse for those peer recovery support services, but also for a health system that connects individuals with other supports that they need in the community. Which are much more cost effective than rest absolutely, of the Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're the best bang for the buck, but we can't even get a nickel. And, and sadly, we can't even get our own policy makers, our own bureaucrats, we can't even convince them to step up for us. So th we got some work to do in that area. I think uh, John is right. I think that there are pockets. So in, in Philadelphia, for example, um, my agency has spent a tremendous amount of resources in both helping to develop uh, peer-based uh, services uh, and to deliver them. And in fact, in, in, in our case, I actually require that any new service that, that comes into our system build into its budget uh, peers uh, um, because we know that, the, that, uh, that people who have lived experience working in these programs are enormously effective at engaging people, keeping people connected to treatment, uh, and, and frankly, making treatment more effective. So I think that I think that the, it is a uh, it, it is a varied kind of field now. But I think it needs to be more standardized and more acceptable uh, across the board. But you know, policymakers, I think if they're willing to be creative uh, and willing to stretch out of the box, can do some things even within the current environment. It just th takes a little political will to do it. And a good example of this is the growing network of recovery high schools and recovery programs in colleges. So thinking about the current situations in which young people find themselves who are in recovery from addiction, helping them recover in an early age. You know, Pat, I must have been channeling to you because <laughs> I, I just wanted to get to the youth po part of this. I know most of what we've talked about in terms of peer recovery has been in the adult sector of, of the recovery community. And we really need to get, as we're talking about prevention and so on, talk about using young people in recovery uh, you know, for, for prevention purposes and to, and to help educate the public. Uh, so indeed, you know, the recovery schools, the recovery programs, uh, we've started, you know, with the young people in recovery and, and, and they've done extremely, extremely well uh, to create a presence. Oh, uh, and we have these videos on our website of young people in recovery. There's nothing more exciting than seeing a 20-year-old in recovery for three years, you know, mm -hmm. who talks about their new life. And that's really what health reform is all about. That's really what talking about addiction and mental illness as a health condition is all about, uh, helping people get help early and staying out of our criminal justice system. That's a great example right there. The recovery community has had no barriers against youth. However, our systems are designed to have different protocols for different age limits, and that's just crazy. They got to get wise in that area. Well, the thing about uh, this whole issue, and let's get back to, to the, the subject matter, which is really getting the message out. Uh, and I'm going to give each one of you, because we're almost running out of time, an opportunity to tell me who your top audience is and what would you tell them in terms of improving the communication about the ACA, about our issues. You get one shot at this, and I'm going to start with Fran. From SAMHSA's point of view, our audience is America. We don't have subsets of America. Uh, to look to. So we, I, I will collect them, uh, bring them all together. Collaboration is the key. If you hear about messaging, that will, everything we've been talking about is about messaging. And, we, and if you could see, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is going to take us years to do. But we have to get ready. And to get ready, we need to begin to help collaborate from the federal government where our role can be to help the states and the communities collaborate together. Youth peers, peer, peer, youth, young people that are in uh, our recovery and are going to be peers, they fare far better and their reach is much more when connected with a prevention program. That prevention program can fare far better when connected with a treatment program or the families of treatment that are supporting someone in long-term or, or in treatment before they um, get into long-term recovery. And then lastly, we need to be 
having a collaborative um, relationship with insurance companies, with healthcare companies, with all different programs that we've already uh, mentioned because we, we need to begin to have America talk about addictions and mental health issues around the Thanksgiving table, just like they do about cancer and heart disease and diabetes. Arthur. And I want to take off uh, on, on the last point because I, th I think that that is a, a great analogy for what we have to do. If you think about breast cancer, for example, 30, 40 years ago, people whispered the, the words, right? People didn't talk about it. Today, people you know, wear pink. Uh, I think many, probably thousands of people have been saved. Uh, their lives have been saved because of the awareness of, of, about that. We have a, a, a um, uh, a lot of resources that are going into to both prevention and treatment and so forth. Uh, I think our, my goal is to have the same thing happen in, in terms of behavioral health conditions. When one, of, one out of five, one out of four people are affected by a, a condition, that is a lot of people. And you're talking about mental illness, for example, that, that's what the numbers are. Uh, if you look at addiction, again, you have a large segment of the population that are uh, affected by these conditions. If we can get the broader community to understand uh, both the impact and the importance in the same way that we have with cancer, uh, I think we can make a huge amount of difference. And that's what our goal is. That's why the recovery walk is so important to us. It's raising people's awareness, uh, why we're doing things like online screening and, and so forth, because it's raising people's awareness in a way that, that uh, mobilizes the community around this issue. Very good, thank you, Pat. Our target audience is the recovery community, people in recovery and family members. and. Uh, the message is that recovery is a reality and mm -hmm. following up on what Arthur said, it's to educate the public and others that people can and do recover. So that's our first message. Our second message is to uh, come together and organize and mobilize uh, to influence public policy because that's really uh, where the rubber hits the road in terms of making sure, for example, that essential health benefits include peer recovery support services. So that's right. our, our message. John. You know, the authentic recovery community has got to take responsibility for their future. You cannot keep relying on other organizations, groups, agencies, defining our lives, our recovery, and our future. It's our responsibility to step up, be heard, be accurate in our description of what we need, how we want to do it. Collaboration is important, but we have got to have our rightful place and funding for this. You know, we have got to stop being scared, fearful, shameful, get out of those basements, get up, get on the first floor and be part of this thing. And indeed, we want to remind our audience that Recovery Month is a particularly good time to take all these messages that we've heard in this show and to really bring them home to policymakers, elected officials, and everyone who needs to be engaged in our field of mental and substance use disorder recovery. And for that, we encourage you to go to recoverymonth.gov and get engaged, get involved, not only in September, but throughout the year. Thank you, it's been a great show. For a copy of this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, call SAMHSA at 1-800-662-HELP or order online at recoverymonth.gov and click on the Video Radio Web tab. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of substance use and mental health problems, to highlight the effectiveness of treatment, and that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and gain access to other free publications and materials related to recovery issues, visit the Recovery Month website at www.recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.